ministerial was, as many of you know, the first ministerial that the OECD had held on internet-related issues in 10 years. The previous one having been held in Ottawa in 1998. And 10 years is a long time in the internet world, and it was well worth the wait. The discussions that had occurred in preparation for the ministerial occurred on a variety of tracks. One were discussions by governments in a sort of traditional OECD fashion. And of course, these were governments associated with members of the OECD but also recognizing the importance of civil society and of corporations and in others as actors with regard to the OECD and with regard to the internet and as their continuing relationship to the OECD. It was decided that there would be multiple sessions that would be organized and would cross-pollinate with each other. And so we had something, and Sam can correct me if I get the numbers wrong, but it was something in the order of about 1,500 people, uh, higher than that. How, how much was it? Two and a half thousand. That included an awful lot of people off the street, I know, uh, who came in. Uh, but it was an extraordinary uh, meeting, uh, both in terms of size and in terms of focus and in terms of information shared. It's also important, I think, uh, particularly since we don't have a representative of the Korean government here who was our host, to recognize the extraordinary job that the Koreans did in hosting uh, the ministerial. Uh, they did it in not only typical Korean hospitality, uh, but also did it at the highest political levels, uh, with the president Lee, uh, having participated uh, and in showing uh, us both in uh, spirit and, in fact, uh, their commitment to the Internet and to the OECD process. The documents that were agreed to, the Declaration, I think are important and well worth using and reading and using. They're important not just because OECD documents usually have significance, they're carefully crafted, they are fact-based, uh, but also, I would say, in this particular case, because they were agreed to not only at the ministerial level by the 30, approximately 30 member countries, but also, I believe, it was by nine other member states that showed great diversity in their, uh, in their relationship to the Internet and to the OECD. They included Chile, Egypt, Estonia, our host government here, India, Indonesia, Israel, Latvia, Senegal, and Slovenia. That gives you some sense of, I think, the power of the Declaration. None of those countries would have been faulted for not being part of it. They were not OECD countries. But they all voluntarily chose to recognize the importance of the Declaration and voluntarily chose to participate. Uh, and so I thought that was really a great signal I would note that our meeting today is uh, not only important as a matter of normal sharing, but also because it was basically called for uh, in the, uh, by the uh, OECD, where the, the declaration made mention about the Internet Governance Forum uh, and uh, invited the OECD to reinforce the cooperative relationships and mutually beneficial collaboration across key stakeholder communities at the IGF. That is obviously what we're doing here, but it's also a signal of things to come, both at the OECD and here and in the future IGFs. So with that, let me turn uh, to our panel. We are very lucky today to have uh, a very distinguished, very experienced set of panelists to discuss uh, the OECD ministerial. Uh, I'll probably do introductions, I guess, as I call on each one to give opening presentations, and then we'll have some dialogue, and I invite you all to think about questions or comments that you might have as well from the audience so that we can make this as interactive as possible. 
I'm going to start with Joe Aladev, uh, at the far end over here, uh, who I imagine virtually everybody here knows. He uh, plays many roles, both at the OECD, uh, but occasionally plays a role at his home company, Oracle, where he's Chief Privacy Officer and Vice President for Global Public Policy. Joe? Thank you. Um, the, uh, the sole ministerial, uh, as was mentioned, was a follow-on to the Ottawa ministerial, and one of the aspects that it took on was it had stakeholder sessions in advance of the ministerial uh, for business, uh, for civil society, uh, and uh, uh, labor, as well as for um, the uh, internet uh, technical groups, as they were called. Uh, and those were very useful events, and to take Sam's direction, I'll focus a little about how the community self-organized around those events. Uh, BIAC uh, is the Business and Industry Advisory Committee to the OECD and is the voice of business at OECD. And while BIAC has a representation across all of the 30 countries uh, of the OECD and all of the observers, uh, it reached out to a number of other business associations in order to broaden its reach uh, into, into uh, countries. So uh, it worked closely with the uh, Federation of Korean Industries, the hosts. Uh, it worked closely with the International Chamber of Commerce, the Global Information Infrastructure Commission, CompTIA, the Global Business Dialogue on e-commerce, uh, the World Information Technology and Services Alliance, and each of those organizations is made up of multiple organizations that operate at the national level. So there was a broad coverage of countries and economies uh, in the mix of businesses. There's also a broad range of types of businesses. So some of these organizations are mostly IT organizations. Some of these organizations are much more horizontal organizations in, in terms of membership. And there was a very broad uh, group of businesses that eventually came together uh, to work on these issues. Uh, what ended up happening was business prepared uh, what essentially it provided to the OECD was a vision and a roadmap for 2018 uh, that highlighted the role of business innovation, the internet, and information communication technologies, uh, their role in driving growth, their role in supporting and providing social benefit. Uh, the relevant papers that were presented can be found on both the BIAC and OECD websites. And, and I just wanted to touch on a couple of the themes uh, that were raised. The, the sub-themes of the ministerials were confidence, creativity, and convergence, and those were the themes that in, in many ways all of the stakeholder groups addressed. Um, but the ideas of convergence were concepts beyond just network convergence uh, to the convergence across digital platforms, to the convergence across models, uh, ideas of user centricity, the participative web, looking at next generation networks, uh, the sustainable economy, both in terms of the transformational benefits that ICTs can play in the environment, as well as the ways that ICTs can help reduce carbon footprint issues within the ICT industry itself, uh, looking at the role of innovation and how it's fueled by creativity, uh, education and skills development, um, the respect and empowerment of stakeholder and the importance of the dialogue between them, and of course, uh, increase in, in issues of trust and confidence, which goes to a number of the security and privacy issues as well. And there was a broad range of discussions across those issues, but a number of those were really what were driving home, and a number of the recommendations were made. And uh, business provided both what business, an inventory of what business was doing, as well as recommendations for how government may continue to work and how there might be greater partnership uh, in working on these issues, as well as stakeholder consultation. Um, and lastly, business wanted to highlight the importance of the continued role of the OECD and the unique nature of the OECD in helping promote a number of these issues and uh, as a very useful forum in driving a number of these issues uh, and the collaborative work that OECD does with other organizations uh, on these issues. Um, with that, perhaps I'll leave it to the question and answer period so we can get a little more interactive and um, turn it back to David. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, Joe obviously was uh, representing the business community, as he pointed out, uh, helping to uh, represent the internet technical community, because he no longer was a government employee, so he's moving over, is Bill Graham, who has the great title of Strategic Global Engagement, Office of the President, 
of the Internet Society. Bill? Thanks very much, David, and uh, thanks to the OECD for the opportunity to uh, share our experiences in preparing for the OECD event. Uh, I, one of the ways we're quite different from uh, Joe's group, BIAC, is that uh, they are a long-term participant in the OECD, and uh, we are a relatively new participant uh, in this formulation. Uh, we in the Internet Society were very honored to have the opportunity to work with colleagues from about 17 other organizations primarily involved in technical aspects of the Internet to create the Technical Community Stakeholder Forum the day before the ministerial. That event offered stakeholders an unprecedented opportunity to interact with ministers and delegates from OECD member states on a broad range of technical, civil society, and private sector issues throughout the stakeholder forums and to share our experiences and exchange perspectives on the future of the Internet economy. A consistent message that emerged from the technical community discussions in Seoul, both in the stakeholder forum and in the subsequent sessions, and I think it's worth repeating, is that the Internet is successful due to its unique model. And uh, our president, Lynn saint Amour, described that uh, quite fully yesterday at the opening, so I won't uh, go into it again here. But I would like to highlight that the genius of the Internet, from our perspective, is that it's individuals, all of us, that make the Internet what it is. And the Internet model, as it's commonly called, relies on multi-stakeholder collaboration and processes that are local, bottom-up, and accessible to individuals around the world, whether they are from academia, research institutions, governments, business, or civil society. The Technical Stakeholder Forum in Seoul was organized following that same model. The 17 organizations we worked with are all active in the Internet's development in their own realm but there are only a small part of those that contribute to the Internet's evolution overall. In our message to the Ministerial, our community emphasized that we're motivated by a common vision of an open, accessible, global Internet and collaborate to create the standards, provide operational oversight, and to build or nurture an environment that will facilitate the Internet's development. Turning then to how we work together, through the Stakeholder Forum, we prepared a formal memorandum that we presented to the ministers of the OECD member states and other stakeholders. We did that through an iterative process, starting with a, a rough draft document with a few points. Then we collected and integrated a, a wide range of comments, as you might imagine, from 17 different organizations until we finally achieved agreement on that memorandum. We scheduled regu regular conference calls as well to uh, touch base and to uh, deal with some of the more uh, difficult points between us to, uh, to come to an agreement. And we finally did a, reach a point where we were well aligned on the messages. It wasn't an easy process by any means because those involved all have their own views on issues, their own priorities, and the organizations have their own mandates. But in the end, through the memorandum, we expressed our shared desire to achieve the fullest benefits of the Internet for all participants in the global economy. The memorandum was founded on a need to preserve five basic abilities in the way we ultimately structured the document. Uh, and all of this is, of course, much more fully available on the website. But the five abilities, I think, are worth noting. The ability to connect, the ability to communicate, the ability to innovate, the ability to share, and the ability to choose. In the memorandum, we encouraged OECD to members and others to join us in an open and collaborative process to support these fundamental capacities. It was interesting and useful to be able to participate actively in this ministerial. It put us in close contact with government officials and with communities of interest from the worlds of the private sector and civil society, some of whom we don't regularly work with. And we really welcome the recognition in the Seoul Declaration that, moving forward, discussions about the Internet should fully engage stakeholders from across civil society, business, and the technical organizations. We made some commitments in our memorandum as well. For example, we committed to develop and deploy technologies and practices to meet the evolving needs of the global Internet. We committed to ex engage with governments and other stakeholders of the OECD and non-OECD countries alike to enhance confidence, ensure security, encourage innovation and interoperability at a global level. 
And finally, we invited governments to join us in an open and collaborative community, together with businesses and civil society, as we work to extend the benefits of the creativity and convergence that make up the internet to all communities in all parts of the world, in an environment that will inspire confidence based on an assurance of security. We were really pleased to hear the OECD's Secretary General Gurria say that he saw the value in the broad multi-stakeholder participation in the ministerial, and to hear him suggest that the OECD explores ways to make that a more permanent feature of the work done there, initially with the uh, Information Computer and Communications Policy Committee. We in the technical community have been working together since the Seoul meeting in June to come to some agreement to reaffirm our interest uh, in continuing our collaboration. Not surprisingly, to me at any rate, the response has definitely been positive. We have put a lot of time now into defining how that work can be accomplished, and we've made a proposal to the OECD. We're looking forward to having an opportunity later this month to present that proposal and discuss next steps. Turning briefly to the takeaways that uh, I personally would bring uh, as I talk about this process of being engaged in the ministerial, I'd like to highlight three points. First off, preparing with our fellow organizations within the technical community itself provided an opportunity to clarify and develop our working relationships in some ways. As I said earlier, we, we make up a very diverse group, and we do work together, but usually on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. Preparing for the ministerial gave us an opportunity and stretched us to find ways of discussing broader issues, as you would expect in discussions of the information economy. I think that was a real community-building exercise for us internally. Second, it allowed us to engage productively with other stakeholders. Throughout the preparations, we worked with civil society, with the trades union organization, and with business and the private sector representatives on our various inputs. Speakers from each of those communities participated in each other's events at the ministerial, and we discussed issues with them throughout the preparatory process. That experience is proving to be a positive link in other forums, including the IGF, because we are working more closely now. And finally, the opportunity to work with governments and other stakeholders was really quite open. The OECD generously encouraged us to comment on, on the full development of the ministerial, to contribute background materials, which we did, and to be involved in the preparation of substantive and pol policy papers that were the inputs to ministers' discussions. The point here is that this exercise was an excellent opportunity to show the value of the multi-stakeholder approach in a forum that's considerably more traditional than the IGF. I believe the success of the multi-stakeholder model in the IGF created a level of comfort that made that work. I also believe the success of the exercise will itself serve as a model to other organizations so that they too can benefit from the broad expertise available t to them through more open processes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, next, we're going to hear from a OECD member country representative, Peter Voss, who has the distinction of having one of the longest titles uh, for a job of, that I'm aware of. He's head of division, international policy for information and communication technologies, Federal Ministry of Economics and Technology of Germany. <laughs> Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, from the perspective of a member country, some ideas, some thoughts. Of course, uh, the German government attaches paramount importance to the Internet economy and to the impact that it will have on future economic performance as well as on issues of social progress, on culture and on research. For this reason, we are proud of the dynamic development that broadband Internet access had, has enjoyed in Germany in recent years. I would particularly like to highlight the fact that for 98% of all German households, broadband internet is accessible. Along with the upgrading of infrastructure, it is particularly important for us to press ahead with the development of technology and its commercial use. We think the Internet of Things and the development of a new Internet of Services will provide new stimuli with far-reaching consequences for business models, international cooperation, and value chains. Um, in Seoul, we especially welcome the fact 
that the OECD at its ministerial meeting has picked up on the topic of ICT and the environment. In Germany, we want to do more than just raise the energy and resource efficiency of the ICT industry itself. Rather, we believe that the ICT industry can make an important contribution to climate protection. This also was, was one of the main focuses of the German IT Summit last month that was attended by Chancellor Angela Merkel as well as leading representatives from business and science. For us, ICT is a matter that should be addressed at the highest levels of power. In our view, the Seoul Declaration is valuable for three main reasons. First, it will enhance awareness of the fact that the Internet, that the internet economy is important for everyone's future. Second, the Seoul Declaration will help us to define common policy objectives to promote the future development and security of the internet economy. And third, it will raise awareness of the fact that it is not only the task of governments to shape the future development of the internet economy. Rather, we think such key issues as the security of the internet depend on collaboration between governments, companies, civil society, and users themselves. This brings us to the point where the vision of the OECD ministerial and the mandate of the IGF partly overlap. In the Seoul Declaration, the ministers invited the OECD to further the objectives set out in that declaration through multi-stakeholder cooperation. Explicitly, as David told us already, they invited the OECD to reinforce cooperative relationships and mutual beneficial collaboration with stakeholders like the internet technical community, the private sector, and civil society within fora such as the IGF. And exactly this is the OECD doing by organizing open fora like this one. But maybe it would be appropriate for OECD to go even one stop a step further with multi-stakeholder participation in regard of discussing public policy issues. If we look into our, our political environment, we realize that other actors on that field, like ICANN and the IGF, established policy shaping processes with strong participation of civil society and the private sector. Others, like ITU, are on their way to open up their structures for an adequate multi-stakeholder approach. Having in mind the World Summit on the Information Society and its follow-up process, the paramount importance of the Internet for many sectors of our societies, and the strongly diverging interests in the fields of business and politics, we think it could be a good step in the right direction to have discussions in the OECD on public policy issues on a broader basis of knowledge, skills, and experience. But taking into consideration the intergovernmental character of OECD, we think there should be no general rules on this topic. We would prefer a case-to-case -case approach to be decided on committee and working group level. We could imagine a consultative role for representatives of the civil society along the lines of the procedural rules in regard of BIAC, the business community of the OECD. These are some remarks and ideas from Germany. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. And I think we'll come back to some of those points and get some reaction to various people on, on that as we look forward. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Representative Labor, Marcus Courtney, who is the head of, Deve of Department of UNI Telecom Global Union. Marcus. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, the OECD for the opportunity to come and speak with you today um, at the forum. I am actually new to my position. I started in July, um, so I missed the sole ministerial, but I did help uh, put together remarks for uni uh, in preparation of that and I believe it was one of the first times that in terms of re labor was recognized as a stakeholder group and I think that that's really significant and it's important especially in the area of the internet that unions have a role to play and the voice of labor has a role to play 
And I know that a lot of people might not actually know what Uni Global Union is, so I'm just going to take a moment to explain that. Uh, we are the Global Union Federation for the world's uh, service trade unions. Uh, overall, Uni represents more than 15 million workers in 132 different countries around the world. The telecom sector in which I'm charged with and represent has more than 3 million workers uh, that work for it in unions all over the world, including, uh, you know, in terms of Africa, Asia, South America, North America, and Europe. And so, in terms of many people don't recognize the actual size and scope and the positive role that trade unions actually play in the ongoing development, economic development, um, that is happening throughout the world, especially in underdeveloped parts of the world. Many people only think unions are located in the, in, in the developed world, and that's actually not true. There's a, there's a very strong and thri thriving uh, global trade movement uh, in underdeveloped countries. Um, I, th I think the sole ministerial is very important, especially in light of where we're currently at when we take a look where, when the sole ministerial happened in the spring and actually where we're at today in the global economy. Uh, in that short period of time, we are actually facing an economic crisis that was unimaginable or probably was not even really talked much about in the sole ministerial meeting, especially at the Internet Governance Forum, around the idea of a financial crisis, and now we're looking at a, we're looking at a very deep global recession. And I think there's several points that the sole ministerial hit on that are absolutely vital. One, it's expanding and recognizing the role of outside of traditional stakeholders when it comes to economic development, as we see here represented on the panel. And I think when you get into the internet and the, um, and the development of the internet for the economy, I think that that's absolutely vital, that we need to look beyond that. And I think labor, as telecommunications unions, as well as represent for information technology unions, that's absolutely vital, is that we engage um, the workers' representatives in the process of economic development. The second thing outside of stakeholder participation as they talk about is, I think, investment in next generation and job creation. And I actually think that that's one of the most important things we could talk about right now in light of what we are facing in terms of uh, the global jobs crisis. And if you actually hear in terms of people are very focused on the financial crisis, and that's one that is obviously a critical aspect, but also we have to look at what kind of investments are we going to make in the future in order to create more jobs, good high quality paying jobs that, uh, that are going to run in the global economy. And clearly the internet is the vital tool. Investment in generating next generation networks, not just around the rest of the world, uh, but also in underdeveloped, in underdeveloped countries is absolutely vital. And I think the sole ministerial was very, had a lot of foresight in highlighting this issue. And I hope that the OECD governments uh, really take this up in a much more dramatic fashion, that we need to create much larger, much more significant investments to make the right kind of climate in order to create more jobs, not just in the telecommunications sector, but um, in terms of the other aspects that internet investment can happen. It's not just about surfing uh, the web faster or downloading movies faster. It's about the idea of telemedicine, about education, um, about uh, new and innovative ways that we can't even imagine that investing in the internet that can happen. And I think this is the time to highlight that the sole ministerial um, um, did. And I think for for as the labor unions and the labor movement, um, these priorities line up exactly with what um, the telecommunications union globally have been talking about when it comes to these issues. We've been talking about increasing investment in next generation networks, universal service, how do we make sure that we expand next generation networks, not just that, so it's not just uh, companies wanting to cherry pick the uh, cream of the crop, but actually developing those networks um, in underserved areas where the market isn't necessarily right away going to react. Um, the creation of high quality paying jobs, and obviously we have an interest in that, but it's clearly that we need to create more jobs to sustain a broader based demand, and I think unions play a unique role in that in terms of with their collective bargaining role with employers. that. The idea of workers being able to bargain with their employers to help sustain and increase uh, to make sure the equitability of distribution happens in a more uh, fair and equitable manner is absolutely vital. And I think that uh, in terms of the OECD is beginning to recognize that when they start allowing the idea of recognition of fundamental human rights uh, into the conversation around the Internet. 
Um, and trade union rights and the right of collective bargaining is a fundamental human right. So I think the idea of linking that up together with the Internet is absolutely, is absolutely vital. The idea we're going to have uh, Internet globally linked uh, that the sole ministerial meeting talks about, that the idea we want to wire up the next billion people through the Internet, and the idea that we're not, we need to have that linked with global, uh, with global basic human rights and trade union rights and collective bargaining rights are part of that process. It's, we can't have both. We can't have linking people up around the world with one more billion people and not recognizing human rights. It's not going to work and we need to link those two together. And part of linking that together is a stronger recognition that labor unions have an important um, role to play. I think uh, just to um, um, conclude uh, on that point is in terms of what we are doing as we move forward with the process in terms of advancing stakeholder participation on these issues. Uh, currently right now the, um, the European Union is, the, is reforming the telecommunications laws uh, in terms of they're having a debate at the European level about the future of telecommunications laws which directly impacts the issues at the sole ministerial in terms of where investment's going to happen, uh, what are the impacts that are going to be on business, what are the rules setting up um, in terms of that, some of the things that we're talking about in the global thing, but also in the idea of stakeholder participation in terms of uh, UNI has been advocating for, uh, for us to have a direct recognition that we are a stakeholder that needs to be considered when writing regulations and the impacts of deregulating, of, of functional separation or structural separation in terms of that, or how things move forward, that uni unions need to be recognized as a key stakeholder. And I think the idea that the OECD was a forefront in recognizing the value of that will help us push forward that agenda that we need to open up these debates and these considerations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, and I think we'll come back to some of those points. And I, worth uh, remembering that at the OECD ministerial there was a substantial amount of discussion uh, about what for many of us is obvious but it's important to remind others uh, that the issues of investment in uh, whether it's next generation networks and so forth uh, is important not only because of the job creation within the industry itself but also by recognizing that uh, the internet and telephony is now become the 21st century backbone for virtually all other industries and all other parts of the economy. And so the health and welfare and investments that occur there, are the benefits are reaped not only th from the industry itself, but are critically important uh, both in the developed and in the developing world uh, for economies generally. So I think the points were ex are extraordinarily powerful. Uh, we're next going to hear from uh, another OECD member country representative, Tom Walker, who is the Director for Europe and International for BRRRR, which is the ministry, and uh, Tom will, as he always has to, explain exactly what BRRRR stands for. Tom? Yes, it's, uh, it's the burden that I carry, I'm afraid. Um, uh, BRRRR is the Department for Business, Enterprise and Regulatory Reform. Uh, and uh, some of you may know it better since uh, from 1973 it was always called the Department for Trade and Industry. So, uh, that is Burr. Um, what I thought I might do was uh, perhaps deviate a little from the brief. Um, thank you, Sam. I can see Sam acquiescing. Um, s simply because it, in terms of our preparation, uh, for the OECD uh, ministerial. We were very lucky in the UK to have started off a process uh, of a, a UK IGF uh, that brings together governments, parliamentarians, industry, civil society, uh, and we simply use that mechanism uh, to develop our dialogue uh, in the UK. Uh, and those of you that were in our best practice workshop this morning, at 11.30, will have heard all about how that worked, and those of you that weren't, won't. But maybe next year you'll have another chance. Um, I always, one of my flaws is that I'm always looking forwards and not backwards. Um, so when I think about the OECD ministerial, um, really I'm thinking about what that means going forwards for, for all of us. Um, and I think that the really positive things coming out of the OECD uh, for me uh, was that kind of reinforcement 
uh, of the OECD role, uh, both as an institution and for member states, uh, in cooperative relationships, uh, and in particular in the cooperative relationship with the IGF. Um, and that kind of reinforcement of the idea that we should all be working collectively uh, with all of our stakeholders. So I thought, well, that's great, um, really good. Um, but of course, you know, the OECD ministerial has a, a pattern uh, where it happens kind of once every 10 years. So kind of small economic accidents like the current downturn can kind of miss the whole cycle and the debate. So I think that that really positive uh, reinforcement from OECD members that they really wanted to have uh, OECD and IGF working together in dialogue um, was you know, something I think we can really build on going forward uh, and was very positive. Um, I was also pleased uh, and, and our ministers were pleased that um, the OECD ministerial had such a strong focus uh, on expanding internet access uh, and use worldwide. And I think that as we look forward to this dare I say, enhanced cooperation between the OECD uh, and the IGF, um, that, that you know, the OECD can really bring uh, a much stronger focus on economics into the IGF debate that we have every year. Uh, I think that I agree uh, very much with uh, the points that Marcus was making, that the emphasis on NGN investment, uh, the emphasis on spectrum liberalisation to release the potential of the wireless internet, the emphasis on creating the right kind of market-friendly environment for convergence, uh, the emphasis on good consumer protection regimes to build confidence are all really important um, if we're going to be able to actually truly expand access. Um, and I think for us, the thing that the OECD ministerial reminded us of uh, is the fact that you know, we really need um, a, kind of a level playing field, open borders, open markets uh, in the internet uh, if we're going to create new jobs, if we're going to create more jobs, um, if we're really going to focus on the entrepreneurship um, that's going to drive job and wealth creation going forward. Um, and deliver lower prices and, and more access. So I think what we're, what we're really looking to uh, out of this process going forwards rather than backwards, sorry Sam, uh, is we're really looking forward to uh, a much tighter collaboration between the IGF and the OECD, um, pulling in all of the stakeholders you know, that really should have a role uh, in shaping economic policy uh, and really having that uh, economic debate uh, about how we're really going to deliver global access uh, going forwards. Uh, and finally, I suppose I can't really finish without uh, thanking Marcus for reminding me that uh, once I've finished here uh, on Sunday, uh, my reward is to go back into the thick of uh, renegotiating EU telecoms laws uh, in a trialogue negotiation between the European Parliament, the European Commission and 27 member states. So <laughs> that will be a bit of light relief for me. Thank you. Th thanks, Tom. And Feel free to stay here longer than Sunday if you need to. Uh, I think I might have to. <laughs> that's right. I understand that sometimes they even get political asylum here, but we'll sign out. <laughs> uh, next, we're going to hear a uh, perspective from civil society. Cadiza Rodriguez is with the Public Voice Coordinator and uh, will give us uh, the views from that. And then I we should invite uh, afterwards to give you a little advance warning here. Thank you. Um, Civil society actively participates in the OCD ministerial meeting through the Public Voice Coalition. Civil society brought the attention of the assembled OECD ministers and me members' country to important concerts of users around the world. For that purpose, civil society participants publish a background paper that offers a series of recommendations and contributions to the OECD ministerial meeting. 
the civil societies together with the organized labor issue a declaration which was signed by more than 19 organizations. Um, civil society together with labor, uh, organized labor organized as a forum where the, we gathered more than 150 people from 50 countries in Seoul in June. The civil society and organized labor declaration was well received by the ministerial and Mr. Chairman Choi even quotes the following paragraph of our declaration. Civil society and organized labor urge that policy goal for the internet economy be considered within the broader framework of the protection of human rights, the promotion of democratic institutions and access to information and the provision of affordable and non-discriminatory access to advanced communication networks and services. Civil society and organized um, Labor made a number of recommendations stressing the need for OECD countries to defend freedoms of expression and in this context oppose mandate filtering, censorship and criminalization of content that is protected under international freedom of expression standards. Protect privacy and transparency by, for example, estab establishing international data standards that are legally enforceable and address the learning and training needs of workers and environmental issues. In addition, civil society urged that civil society advisory committee to the OECD be established to formalize its, particip its participation in the work of the ICCP committee. Chairman Choi also affirmed that the ongoing importance of privacy protection at the ministerial conference, stating that the protection of privacy was identified as a cross-cutting challenge to be systematically addressed at the earliest possible design stage of technology. Mr. Angel Jurria, the Secretary, Secretary General, also spoke about privacy protection and described the 1980 OECD privacy guidelines as the foundation guideline for most countries' privacy standards. He remarked that the privacy guidelines have stood the test of time, but that the growing growth of business model built around data mining and the multiplication of social networking sites require that we understand and ask ourselves what are the risks, what are the benefits, and how to adapt our policy to this new environment. Civil society and organized labor unions, uh, organized laborers, further urge to the OECD to establish the Civil Society Advisory Committee. The creation of the OECD Civil Society Advisory Committee will help meet demo the democratic goals of inclusion, participation, transparency, and accountability in international decision-making process. In reply, the Secretary General of the OECD recommend to begin, begin the process of formalization of the participation of civil society and the technical community in the work of the OECD on the internet economy. Civil society participants have submitted a consensus proposal to the next ICCP OECD committee for the establishment of the Civil Society Information Society Advisory Council for its approval at its meeting on this December 11, 12. Under the chapter, the Civil Society Advi uh, Information Society Advisory Committee Council will engage in a constructive input and dialogue with the ICCP committee about policy issues of interest to civil society and push the agenda set out in the Civil Society Seoul Declaration. Among others, there were additional uh, suggestions that were highlighting uh, that were not highlighted in the ministerial. As far Civil society on the privacy front, civil society position argued for a strong comprehensive data protection legislation with effective enforcement mechanisms and independent bodies with a mandate to protect privacy and ensure that bodies have su sufficient resources to oversee privacy law in both private and public bodies. Develop, we urge also to develop a better understanding of the challenge uh, of industry consolidation support to post to the open internet. On the copyright front, it was emphasized that the objective of in intellectual property law is to balance the need to provide incentives to creators and owners and the benefits derived from allowing the general public to access and use those works. This balance is especially crucial for the collaborative process of the participatory web. Civil society also raised concerns about uh, the secrecy of the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement Act, 
process and the possibility of policies that may limit legitimate business activity, the participate web and e government service delivery. The policy paper expressly states there is a, that there is a growing concern regarding new rules in the so-called ACTA that are disrespecting of user privacy, communication security, and the right to anonymous speech on, on one hand, and to require internet service provider to restrict access and expedi expeditious disclose subscribers information to assist copyright enforcement. Civil society also requests man, ma, to maintain a balanced framework for intellectual property protection based upon mechanism, upon mechanisms that are least intrusive to personal privacy and least restrictive for the development of new technologies and to promote creativity and learning. Encourage the promotion of the definition of open standards that supports economic and social developments and support the effort of the OECD to promote access to the full range of the world culture and to ensure that internet economy reflects the true diversity of language, art, science and literature in our work. Support open access to government funding, scientific and scholarship works and emphasize access to information as a fundamental human rights and support the OECD continued work in this area. Civil society also oppose discrimination by network provider against particular applications, devices or content and to maintain the internet rules in fostering innovation, economic growth and democratic institutions. Civil society right now is waiting for the next ICCP meeting that will be held uh, a few days after the IGF and we have, we have a positive uh, constructive uh, dialogue for f here and the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, as our last speaker, uh, we have a uh, non-member economy representative uh, Gulshan Rai, who's the director at the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology here in India. Um, I guess you should use the podium since we have no more space here. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Gross. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, dignities on dice and participants, it's really a pleasure for me to come here and share what progress or what steps we have initiated after the last ministerial declaration at Seoul. Uh, India has initiated several measures in line with those declarations. We have realized that <clears throat> internet economy is important for our economy there. We are in line through spirit of the Seoul declarations. We are encouraging mutual collaborations with the stakeholder within the country as well as internationally. Government has taken several steps to move in these directions. Our internet penetration has expanded. Now we are almost 80 million users, internet users in the country over there. The, we had initiated the steps to install the national knowledge network because we feel that our education system should be connected on the internet to reap the benefits of the internet economy. That's the basic thing there to start. I am happy to say that we have moved forward and number of institutions will get connected on the very high broadband uh, knowledge network ranging from one gigabits per second by the this, by end of this, this month. We have, <clears throat> for the growth of the internet economy, we have initiated steps to form e-governance standards so that the whole hardware and applications, software applications, they are grown on those standards and the robust structures comes up which may help in our, the, in, in our progressing the economical measures. The efforts are made to secure this infrastructure <clears throat> in various steps have been taken both at the level of policy or implementing, implementing other measures uh, to secure our infrastructure. We are taking steps to educate or to do the capacity building over there, to install the security infrastructure at our steps there and other data centers which necessary steps. The, the legal framework is being expanded are being amended there and we hope that in this in the current session the parliament which is going to start from 10th of December those amendments which we talk about it which will make our laws one of the most comprehensive laws in the world in line with the European Council will be passed and 
we will be at a, at a sound platform to, at least from the legal point of view, to address the issues which arise from the internet economy. Uh, I, and this is a short presentation I thought I'll give the progress which we made after the sole declaration. I once again thanks the chair for giving opportunity to share the things. Thank you. All right, now the hope is that we'll start into the more interactive part of the program. Let me start off with a question, but I want to make sure that everyone in the audience knows that uh, I'll be calling on people if you don't come up with good and important questions here. So get your questions ready, please. Let me start off if, uh, with a general question uh, that I'd like to have everyone, if possible, address, which is uh, we had the ministerial. It was a terrific success, as we all discussed. Important progress was made, as reflected in the declaration. Where are we going from here? Where should the OECD go? What should the discussion be about? What should the focus uh, really be uh, uh, laser in on? Joe, let me start off with you. Um, I think one thing, I just want to make one clarification before I get, I get to the answer, if that's okay. And, and that was um, a number of people raised the, the role of cooperation and multi-stakeholder within the OECD. What I wanted to raise is the issue that's on the table, which is new, is the formalization of that role. But I do want to raise that there has been multi-stakeholder cooperation and input in the OECD as long as I've been there, and I was there back when I had actually hair. Um, so we're talking 12 years ago when I started sitting in a chair in the OECD, there was already multi-stakeholder input through TUAC. Um, ISOC occasionally used to come in on a BAC delegation. Um, civil society was often invited as an expert. Uh, the uh, Ottawa ministerial, which occurred 10 years ago, actually had stakeholder representation, not as formalized with uh, ISOC and the technical community. But I just did want to clarify that the OECD has had actually a very long history of multi-stakeholder cooperation. Uh, and I think that gets to the answer to your question, which is I think that's one of the interesting points of it, because the OECD looks at policy in a very substantive manner, looking at frameworks that are very important, like the privacy guidelines, which even though developed and promulgated in 1980, have stood the test of time because they were written at a level of principle that continues to be applicable today. So. I think the, the, the issues which the Ottawa Ministerial highlighted, sorry, the Seoul Ministerial highlighted very well was that we are now looking at issues that go beyond countries, that go beyond enterprises, and really are issues of the ecosystem. And it is the issues of convergence, it is the issues of Web 2.0, it is the issues of many of the things that we do in our real life no longer are neatly bounded by borders that are national or geographic. And how do you start dealing with the fact that rules and regulations are made in a bounded fashion that are bounded to nations and geographies? And I'll take a point I raised this morning, which is I think the OECD in some cases helps us find the ways to interoperate across what are national and geographic uh, frameworks and regulations uh, to deal with global information flow services and processes that are more and more beyond national boundaries. Well, as uh, the other panelists uh, focus on this future question, uh, let me play a little bit off and ask people to comment a little bit uh, on what Joe is referring to here, which is uh, the OECD is a carefully tailored membership of certain economies and governments that have certain core characteristics. It's not open to just anyone who would like to join. How does that impact the role of non-state players, particularly those that come from countries that are not members of the OECD? And related to that, as uh, Joe points out, if the internet is by its nature an unbounded global phenomenon, what is the appropriate role of the OECD, which has as its core the 30 member countries, which presumably will increase, but still is a limited number of primarily developed countries, how is it to play that role going forward? Who would like to start? All right, Bill. I knew you'd volunteer. 
Yeah, I usually do. Thanks, David. Um, interesting questions. I mean, moving forward from the ministerial, I think the work plan that uh, that was discussed in Seoul is is quite solid. I think the OECD has a, a well-established uh, set of competencies and expertise, and I think it's important to continue to build on those uh, moving forward. So I think the internet economy and the internet society bring up a whole bunch of new issues as everyone has noticed that's why there was a ministerial uh, but looking forward at things like uh, how do we how do we talk about uh, privacy in the internet age uh, a lot of that is being subsumed by discussions of cybersecurity cybersecurity gets tied up in concepts of national security and then it just uh, falls apart from my perspective in, in the internet society it really is very different to talk about network security, cyber security, and trust and identity. Uh, we're doing a lot of work trying to shift now that concept from a, a focus on security to a focus on trust and identity and following our, our basic tenet of you, basing our, our view of the world from the user. What do we need to do to empower the user uh, to deal with the, the new um, dangers that exist on the internet, quite frankly, or are created by new technologies. So expanding that, that view of privacy and security into these new realms in a way that is, uh, is more in terms of empowerment than restriction. I think that that's really vital to the continued innovation and uh, creativity on the internet. Uh, there's already been work started on Web 2.0, for example. Uh, there's interesting work. Uh, being done or being proposed on virtual worlds. I think uh, that's something that, that's really interesting uh, going forward. One thing that preoccupies us is what uh, we jokingly called, uh, call the adoption of broccoli technologies. Uh, that's things like uh, IPv6, as one of your presidents uh, notoriously said some very unkind things about broccoli. Uh, there's, you know, it's good for you, but why would you ever, uh, ever have anything to do with it? Looking at uh, what you do when there may not be a business case for adoption of technologies that are good for the internet, good for the economy, good for the world, I think that's an area the OECD could, uh, could engage in very well. Uh, also, a lot of the ongoing uh, work on research and development and the evolution uh, of the, the, the Internet moving into the, the future. To reply a little bit to your, the set of questions that you raised, the OECD does come, is a, a group of countries that uh, adhere to certain principles and meet certain standards. Many of those uh, based around liberalization in many of its meanings. Uh, they also, for that reason, tend to be some of the more advanced uh, economies in the world, very obviously, uh, and therefore more on the bleeding edge of dealing with some of these issues. I think that's something that, uh, that the OECD should uh, embrace and recognize its role as an early, early adopter and an early, uh, or a group of countries who have to deal with challenges uh, early on in the uh, in the development process. I also think, however, that OECD is doing tremendous work in reaching out to the less developed countries and economies, and uh, I think that's vital. One way that can happen is by engaging uh, other stakeholders, because we all have well-developed networks that reach into uh, the less developed parts of the world, and we can, uh, you can use our expertise and our connections to bring those things in. Thanks. Marcus? Um, I think that uh, one of the things that's been very good about the work the OCD has been doing, especially around the Internet, is actually looking at broadband development, where it's happening, where it's not happening, and the data speeds, which we find absolutely invaluable. But I think we need to push that again. I think uh, looking at the environment that we are, are facing right now, which I think is very interesting. For example, you know, between the United States, I mean, we're looking at the collapse of the automobile industry in Germany. You're looking at uh, Mercedes has furloughed its factories for six weeks, uh, which has never happened in 100 years. Um, and you think of those industries as their old line manufacturing industries. And I think what you talked about at the very beginning was is the Internet is the backbone of the new economy, of the 21st century economy is, is the Internet. 
And I think it's not, it's not, any, it's not any accident right now that, in the, that we're seeing the new economy, we're, the OECD is starting to highlight it, and then we're looking at what we call the real economy or some of that older, you know, industrial revolution economy that's really starting to see some severe, se a, a severe economic crisis. And I think that the, we really have to invest a lot more in trying to figure out is how do we really develop this 21st century economy for around broader aspects of economic development and job creation. I think that's one key aspect. I think in terms of the aspect of undeveloped countries, it's very interesting. I'm not a fan of Thomas Friedman, um, but I do think that he's pointing out one thing about the concept of a flattener that the internet is actually developing. And you actually take a look at India, and it, I think that's really relevant. It's not necessarily in terms of how of a, a, a vital role that India is playing in the development of technology. And it's a unique role. It's being recognized continually through global, uh, in the global economy around technology. And it's flattening. It might not be, uh, in, it's a flattening through its use of innovation, uh, through its use of education and things like that. And it's, it's leveling out and it's competing a lot with the OECD countries and that's due to the internet. And I think that needs to be recognized um, by, uh, by the OECD. <coughs> You want to comment on that? Yeah. I'll pick up from what Joe said and what Ambassador Gross said. <clears throat> Ambassador, you made a very excellent moderation in the morning session. The security and privacy are very important for the growth of the internet economy. I 100% agree my uh, speaker there. Now, OECD has rich experience. They have come out with a privacy guideline. This striking a balance between security and privacy is an important issue there. If you are able to strike a balance, definitely it's helpful and it's very essential, beneficial for the growth of internet economy there. This, the balance, of course, it will vary from country to country or it will vary from culture to culture over there. But we look forward from OECD to some framework in this regard that really will help many of the countries like India or other developing countries in growth of the internet economy. Peter? Yes, thank you. In addition to what was just said, uh, I also think uh, what can the OECD do? We are living in, a, uh, in an environment that's getting more and more complex and that doesn't uh, make life easier. So we have to balance between economic growth and social balance, for instance. Um, we have to, to face the challenges of globalization. Um, but we, do not, uh, we cannot forget that the uh, outcome of OECD, its uh, guidelines and recommendations in regard of a political framework, a regulatory framework, uh, for governments. Of course, uh, as the input for this uh, framework, for this guidance, for these recommendations, I think it would be wise to have a, a, a broad environment, as broad as possible, with civil society, with uh, neighbor, uh, to have as much as possible uh, input. But the output will certainly not be in regard of investment of industry. Uh, it will be in regard of frameworks that government can provide for the industry. So I think we should be aware of this. Thank you. Right. Tom, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, perhaps a slightly different point. I mean, the global economic crisis has shown us that you know, institutions like the OECD, kind of bounded jurisdictions, um, you know, have always had to deal with unbounded economies, and you know, no one can can kind of say, well. This is the border of my jurisdiction, therefore I can control everything that, that happens within it. And I don't think that's ever been the case. So we, we're kind of 